And now, broadcasting from a bar in some random guy's basement, your hosts, Dean Winch and Jason Johnson. Hello, folks, and welcome to Brunology, the podcast, the fusion of beer and knowledge. I'm your host, Dean Winch, with me tonight's Jason Johnson. How are you doing tonight, Jason? Doing okay. How are you doing? I'm okay. Uh, trying to yeah. recoup from this weekend. I had a pretty, <laughs> pretty rough weekend. It was a pretty rough weekend. Yeah, we uh, we both had our, our BJCP exams this last weekend. Uh, mine was the tasting exam. Jason took the written exam. Uh, how do you feel that went? Uh, the written exam, I'm a, I'm a little unsure about. I guess that could go either way. I Last time I took it, it was in 2005, and that was the legacy uh, exam where you had to do 10 questions. This time, it was five essay questions and then 20 true or false, and that's in an hour and a half. And uh, it, for me, it all depended on what styles I got as far as my compare and contrast. And one of the, and it, you have two questions like that, and one of them one of them I knew, if I can, I don't recall. Oh, it was like a Sweet Stout, um, Robust Porter, and uh, another beer. I don't rem- recall right off the top of my head. Those I think I, I did fairly well on. And then the other set was Beer de Garde, California Common, and Dusseldorf Alt. And I think I may have struggled a little bit uh, with those. I uh, went and looked at the guidelines after, and I, I hit several key points. I just am not sure if I did enough. My recipe formulation, I felt I nailed it at the time until pencils down and I realized I forgot to list my batch size and my efficiency. So oh, the infamous pencils down. Yep. Pencils down. It's and, like grade school flashbacks all over again. Yep. So I hope I hope I did enough that those are the only two minor errors I made on there and I'm confident on the true false. I'm sure I got a hundred percent on there. So I'm feeling okay that I did well. Whether I scored 90 or above could be another question, but I think I I may be close. So it could be a coin toss, I think, but uh, I'm not overly confident. Yeah, I guess we'll see. Yeah, so all you can do is wait now. Now the waiting, that's the hardest part. Yep, yep. Not as much for me because I've already got my rank, so you are waiting on your results from your tasting exam. I am. I am waiting with... uh... On pins and needles, just waiting. I know it takes months. And that's about uh, February, probably. You know, three to four months. Yeah. So normally, what? Yeah. How long it takes? That's a long time. Just kind of one of my my synopsis of the exam. Overall, I went in pretty nervous. Well, you passed out, didn't you? I did. I did pass out. <laughs> I did. I didn't pass out. That's a little so, online joke. Yeah. Follow <laughs> the Facebook page. You'll catch up on that. Um. Yeah. But no, it was. It was a lot. It was. Everything I expected it to be, and then some yet. I mean, uh, the environment, I wish I wish we would have had a little different environment. Um, there was a little ambient noise. The lighting was good. Uh, I felt that the the service was, I, I wasn't expecting the way they handled it. They poured beers into pitchers and then served us cups from pitchers. Yeah. So for me, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting to have a bottle in front of me that I had to crack or or would be cracked by what you know me and the the other guy at the end of the table, but that didn't happen. So that kind of threw me off a little bit. So it took me a beer or two to regroup from that. But and then there were they bring them out at fifteen minute intervals. So sometimes they would bring them out early, but uh, if the server didn't announce the beer, then you knew you still had some time left. But if they announce the name of the beer and you're still writing on mouthfeel or overall impression of the beer, well now you know you're a little bit behind. Right. So you can keep that mental clock in your head, which was nice. It was nice that he did that. So, Well, the, the reason they poured them into pitchers is to try to keep everything as even as possible. Yeah, because you can get some sediment in a bottle. You can get half pours. We talked about right. that on the show in the past. Yep. yep. So. so they try to ensure everybody's got the same stuff. And we, uh, we had our, our exams were at Northern Brewer, uh, the Milwaukee location. And it, it's a, it was cool to be down in the basement, but you're right. You know, they came through with a pallet jack. And they were loading up some some orders and stuff, and that, I could see how that would be a little distracting. Yeah. I was cramming at that time. Uh, I had because... a wa- had a water pipe above me that was. Uh, they were doing a brewing demonstration upstairs that day, and I could tell that they were running water through their sink and the water pipe out in the room right above my head at my table. So <laughs> every time they would rinse out equipment or something, it would kind of throw me off a little bit. But huh, 
well, you know, the world's kinda, not perfect. No, I it's guess. not perfect. Like I said, it was it was nice of Northern Brewer to let us do that, and it was nice of of the beer barons to put that on and, and everything. I think it went off very well. We had uh, six styles. We had uh, uh, wit beer, a German pills, a uh, special premium bitter, a triple uh, Schwartz beer, and a barley wine. Some of them were commercial. Some of them were homebrew. So it was it was definitely a nice mix. They 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 staggered them properly when they gave them to us. They started us with the lighter stuff, and we ended with the larger, bigger stuff, the darker stuff. So it was uh, it was an overall a good experience. I, I I don't think I did very well. I think I probably let my nerves get the best of me. But uh, well, we talked about you know the three that are all on your shoulders. So it doesn't matter how well you matched. Yep. Well, the problem with the three that are on my shoulders is the fact that I still had to know the styles going in, and I studied studied my ass off. For a week ahead of time, cram, cram, cram. But I mean, to be honest, I didn't study barley wine. I probably should have, because I should have guessed that they were going to end big. Yeah. But I didn't, so I kind of guessed on that. And it was an American barley wine, so now you got to compare the American and the English, and you got to go through them in your head. And I know a little bit about them because we had a Manti Malters competition on that, so I kind of remembered a little bit from that. But yeah, overall, I think it was okay. I'm, I'm just hoping to get it recognized out of it. And, I think he'll do fine. Not have to retake it again too terribly soon, but it was interesting. Yeah. I'm glad it's over. Yeah. Well, I'm glad some other things are over as well. We um, we have something we should probably mention. Yeah, let's bring uh, that up right Some away. stuff uh, went down over the same weekend. It actually was the day before we had our exam, so it was a little unneeded uh, stress. Yeah. Uh, as it turns out, our web or our, our chosen name... Yeah, Brunology. Was, uh, yeah, it was a little close to another... Uh, popular blog and so we were flamed i think uh, on on the internet a little bit and accused of trying to steal somebody's somebody's uh, thunder and trying to piggyback off somebody else's success recognition and yeah. uh, that's not the case never was the case never will be the case you know, um the way that the, the way that our name was chosen was right down here in this bar it was actually dean's wife came up with the name and I'm sure she's never even heard of this website and we liked it and uh, just through talking, we thought that using an umlaut would be kind of uh, look a little better on a logo than than the EW. So yeah. that's what we went with, and it turned out to be a mistake. And um, the only thing, you know, everything was, was pretty smooth in the transition. But I, I you know, the, the only thing that upset me was being accused of things we weren't doing. Yeah, you know, it's, it goes it goes back to what what I had. There's two sides to every story. If you don't know the facts and you're going to be the person who's going to come out of the gate swinging and you're going to be accusatory, I'm sorry, you're going to look like the fool. Yeah. It, Whether, it, and it wasn't the, the, the owner of the website that came no, out. No, it, absolute, it, was, it absolutely was, was not. Um, it was, uh, that person didn't seem to help our case at all, but no. that was not the, it wasn't the, it wasn't our intent and that person was not off putting over it. In hindsight, I guess can't blame the person. Right. But, I think it could have been handled a little better. I mean, there was no, we didn't mean no harm. There was no ill harm meant. There was no, we weren't out to, to piggyback. We weren't out to do anything wrong. We were just. We're trying to have a good time. It's it, really all we're trying to right. do. And, and it looks better. It honestly looks better than, well, than what we've got now. Yeah. So, But it, in the end, uh, Dean and I talked about it, and we felt uh, it, it was just uh, the respectable thing to do to, to just bow out and and change the name to a, a EW, so yeah. we're going to be Brunology now and not Brunology. I guess that's the, <laughs> right. I guess that's right. the only way that that's that the you only can way you it. can put it, unless you're physically looking at it. It's going to be said the same way. It's going to just be spelled different. So that's a positive. We didn't have to go through and re-record all of our right. all of our stuff. So, but on that note, just uh, if you are following us and you're paying attention, we are going to change all of our stuff that we've got the Spreaker account. The Facebook page, the website, it's all going over to B-R-E-W-N-O-L-O-G-Y. It, so, and it has all been switched for the most part, I think. Yeah, yeah I switched Tumblr today, so. Okay. Well, I think everything should be. I know I'm still getting the, the old, up. I'm still getting the old feed on my Spreaker, but maybe I gotta take that one out and bring the other one in. So, it's something we can look at, but make sure you follow us. We're just changing the name. Come back. We, nope. you know. nope. We're not affiliated with anybody else we're not trying to jump on anybody else we're just trying to put out a podcast and no, they're just two guys trying to have a good time this that's all this is we're not we're not trying to steal anybody's thunder so if there's anybody else that thinks we're uh thinks we're doing this to jump on their back or something you're uh you're wrong because we're not we're not out to do that so 
We're not affiliated with anybody, like Jason said, but we're... We just picked a name. We just picked a name. <laughs> well, we picked a name based off of what we were trying to do. We, I mean, And the domain was open. The do- Yeah, the domain was open. So we grabbed it. And, you know, we, uh, we've we got beer and knowledge. So how else do you describe that you want to do beer and knowledge without beer and knowledge? I mean, brewnology makes sense. Right. So but. we've got it figured out. We're good to go. Let's move on. That's, yep. Uh, it's a new chapter. New chapter. So, again... Follow us, Brunology, B-R-E-W. Brunology, the podcast. I think we should mention a sponsor or two at this time. This segment is brought to you by SS Brewtech. Check out ssbrewtech.com for high-quality and affordable conical fermenters, brew pots, and they have stainless steel mash tuns. They're also the creator of one of my favorites, the stainless steel brew bucket. It's something that I use quite often in my brewing, and I highly recommend. Okay. Um, so with that, I think we are going to do... Our style of the night. All right. What do we have for tonight? Tonight's style is a 7B, as in boy, 2015 guidelines. It is a alt beer, otherwise known as a sticky, sticky. It's uh, you, the used to be called in the 20, 2008 guidelines as the Dusseldorf alt. But in the 2015, they just changed it to alt beer. Yeah. So our sample tonight is, uh, as you just heard Jason crack before, our sample is from Summit Brewing Company. From their Unchanged series, it is uh, batch number 20, the Sticky Alt, Dusseldorf-style ale. It's difficult to get an authentic Dusseldorf alt here in the U.S., at least where Dean and I live. So yeah. this was a commercial example available to us, so this is the one that we are choosing to evaluate. Yeah. So let's take a look at it real quick. Um, yeah, I know uh, I was smelling it while you were discussing the style a little bit. Uh, what I get... Uh, is a little bit of a, I get some rich and deep, deep malts, lots of a uh, melanoidin, caramel, a uh, little toasty character to it, a uh, little chocolate background notes. I get some spicy hops in there, as you should. It, I think it's clean. I don't get any esters or any, any phenols in there. Um, to me, it smells a little, a little malty sweet, which is, which is okay. And I get a little bit of very low alcohol here. Yeah. Um, in the aroma. The aroma, I, I'm, I'm getting, uh, just grabbing it here, it's, uh, I'm getting some grainy, a little bit of toasty. I'm picking up, like, hints of, like, a, like, a sweeter, like, a Munich malt or something, almost even. It almost has, like, a hint of dry to it. Like, like, the spicy hop character almost balances with the malt and makes it smell kind of dry, like a, a real dry aroma. Like dry grains, you mean? Yeah, or? yeah, kind of. Yeah. Uh, um, I would say it's almost, like a metallic, kind of a kind of a metallic smell, kind of almost. I don't know if that must come from the minerally, 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 yeah, uh, like from the water, possibly, possibly. Um, but that's what I'm getting for the aroma, for the appearance. It's a beautiful beer. Oh, it's beautiful beer. It's dark amber, copper, uh, tall tan head. Um, just kind of hangs around. Uh, it's that nice tight bubbles on it. Crystal clear example. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful beer. I've got the same. I'm, I'm saying this is deep amber. It's almost brown. You're right. It's clear. Nice. It's a well-formed head. And it's long-lasting. I think it's a very pretty beer. Yeah, it definitely lingers around a little bit. What about the flavor? Flavor, I'm picking up um, picking up a little bit of dry malt graininess. Um, it starts off sweet, but it finishes... starts off sweet, but finishes kind of um, grainy, kind of... That, that, that grainy, back-to-the-aroma... Um, comment that graininess. Mm-hmm. Um, the hop are, the hops are present. Um, they're they're not really assertive. They're they're definitely there, but I would not call them assertive. I call them on the higher end, but not assertive. They're peppery. They're spicy. Um, I'm not getting anything that's overpowering. It finishes clean. Um, doesn't linger unpleasantly on the palate, and uh, I, I just think that the malt and the hop balance is proper. And I- I think for me the flavor matches a lot of the aroma. I get a lot of that uh, rich, deep, uh, toasty, melanoidiny kind of uh, of malt. I get a little little caramely sweetness in there. I think it's a little sweet up front, and I also I also feel it stays sweet all the way through. For me, what what balances out that sweetness, and it's just what the style calls for, is um, that it's it's well balanced. The bitterness from the hops kind of cuts down that sweetness. If that hops hop bitterness wasn't at the level that it, that it's at. I think this beer would would be uh, a finish out sweet and it would linger sweet. Um, I do get a little low alcohol um, flavor in there as well, 
And uh, the hops uh, match just perfectly with the aroma. I think they're pretty spicy. I also think it's a, a medium-bodied beer. Uh, to me, it seems highly carbonated. Uh, it's very, very effervescent and, and prickly in the mouth. Uh, but it does, uh, the, you know, when you wash a little bit out of the way and you swish it around in your mouth, it, it's got a creamy texture to it and uh, no astringency. No, I didn't pick up any astringency either. I did. I do agree that it is a, a medium-high carbonation level. And it's a, a medium-bodied beer. It's very prickly on the palate. It's um, it, it balances out very nicely. So, yeah, it's a... It's a good beer. Overall, what do you think? Well, first, I think we should talk about what we what this style calls for. Okay. And looking at the style, um, just to, to give an overview of the of what the style calls for in the guidelines, it, it should be well balanced, well attenuated, bitter yet malty, clean and smooth, clean and smooth, amber to copper colored. Um, bitterness is balanced by the malt by the malt richness. Uh, malt intensity and character can range from moderate to high. And bitterness should increase as the malt intensity increases. I think this beer accomplished that very successfully, in in my opinion. So overall, I gave this beer a 40. Uh, my only critique on it, and this is just a very minor critique, is I, I felt it, it was too sweet for him. Really? For what I think. Too sweet. Yeah. Um, like I said, the bitterness helps um, dry it out or give the impression of dryness. But when when I was paying attention to the sweetness throughout the whole time it was in my mouth, I I just I felt it was a little sweeter than it should have been. It should be a little more well attenuated. That malt flavor should still be there, but the sweetness should not disappear. Um, it is a sticky, which which is supposed to be almost like what a German would consider an imperial version of yeah, I mean, the style. It's six point three percent, so okay. I mean it, it is a a larger beer. It's not huge, but it's larger. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree with your overall synopsis. Um, I thought it was a good style example, a great example, actually. Um, the hops were pleasant. They weren't overpowering. They were peppery, spicy. Um, the malt has a bit of a, a caramel character to it. Um, but I, I think that the hop character and the malt, I think that does finish a little dry for me. Um, okay. And, and that, that could be a balance of the hop, the spicy hops with the, with the malt and, I mean, it, it could even, I mean, it's an alt beer. It could even be a characteristic of fer fermentation, too. I mean, who knows? But um, I, I gave it a 39. I, I'm right with you on your 40. I, I gave it a 39. I thought it was a very good beer. So. Okay. Well, I think we should maybe talk about some interesting notes or even some style comparisons of this before we move on. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, give us a give, little, give us give a little bit uh, Give us a little bit oh, of you history. Want me, me to do it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Well, um, some interesting notes are the sticky, uh, which is what we had. I'm, I'm, and I could potentially be butchering. Yeah, if the we're butchering the name, we're sorry, but yeah, because I have I didn't take any German in junior high or high school, so I don't know. Maybe it's sticky, sticky. I don't know. But, good, oppor um, good opportunity <laughs> to send us some feedback at brunology.com. Absolutely, with an EW. Yes, it's uh, it's generally that's generally referred to as the stronger version of the style, the uh, imperial, if you will. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, it's referred to in the 2008 guidelines as a Dusseldorf Alt. Now, when you're studying for the BJCP exams, uh, as, as Dean knows, even for the, the entrance exam or the written exam, style comparison is important. And that's one thing I really like that they've done in the 2015 guidelines, is they have a section in the guidelines for style comparison, which is going to be pretty pretty nice for studying. And... Under alt beer, uh, for style comparison, it says it's more bitter and malty than international than other international amber lagers. Somewhat similar to California Common, which would explain why on my written exam those two were, were in the same yep. area. Somewhat similar to California Common in both production and technique, flavor and color, though not ingredients. Which brings me to the next section, which is general ingredients, which is generally German-based malts, usually Pils malt, sometimes Munich. Small amounts of caramel, chocolate, or black malts are used to adjust color. And some uh, Dusseldorf alt beers may include wheat. Spall tops are traditional, but saws can be used. Uh, clean, highly attenuated yeast, and usually it's a step or decoction mash. Ale yeast. Forgot. Ale, I forgot yep. to mention it was ale. Yep. Yes. Ale yeast. Ale yeast at cooler, at cooler temperatures. Cooler temperatures. Yep. Which is where you get the alt beer from. Correct. Yep. Um, and it's funny that, um, when you go back to comparison, 
You had said that it's somewhat similar to California Common, both in production technique and finished flavor and color, though not in ingredients. Correct. When I did my online 200 question exam, I got hammered with comparison questions for, yes, you did. for alt beer. California Common, it was just one after another after another. I remember you telling me that. It was crazy. So, yeah, they're they're very similar. And, and like Jason said, if you're going to consider using this as a backdrop for some kind of an exam study or something, I recommend putting an asterisk next to California Common and Alt Beer because <laughs> <laughs> there's a pretty good potential you might get nailed with that. And Beard Guard because evidently that's one that they toss in as well. Yeah. So that, that that's what was on mine. Everybody wants to concentrate on IPAs, stouts, pale ales, and stuff. That You might want to know your Alt Beers and California Commons. Yep. Just saying. Well, I think we should do another... Sponsor identification. Yeah. This segment brought to you by homebrewsupply.com. Visit homebrewsupply.com for all your online brewing needs. They've got grains. They've got supplies. They've got kettles. They've also got this really cool thing called Recipe Builder. What's Recipe Builder? Recipe Builder is pretty cool. Take all the items you need from the recipe in front of you. Go ahead and throw it in your cart. Put it in a box. Ship it to your house. Open your box. Throw it in your kettle. Go ahead and brew. Go ahead and check out homebrewsupply.com. Use Recipe Builder. So um, the other thing I want to bring up now is um, we usually do a, a flaw. So we'll Switch off between a flaw or a technical topic. Yep, and our, our last one we did a uh, technical topic. So tonight we're going to do a flaw. We are going to do a uh, SL, acid, bleh. acetaldehyde. Yes, that one. Yes. Not not the other not the other one, that one. So, not um, the astehyde. Not the astehyde. <laughs> Never go astehyde. <laughs> so, AT. It's a movie quote. Go ahead and look it up. Acetaldehyde. The flavor and aroma on acetaldehyde, it almost comes off like a fresh cut green apples, um, sometimes cut grass. So it's kind of... It's, it's very specific. It is. You really, you it's, either have it or you don't. Yep. It's it's cut green apples. Like you cut a Granny Smith open, that's, that's it. You know, because you can get esters and things that are palm fruit, you know, be it apple or whatever, but yeah. Um... Causes it's uh it is a byproduct of fermentation. You're always going to have it in there. Uh, the yeast will tend to convert it to ethanol, alcohol, during the the regular fermentation process. But chemically speaking, there is little difference between ethanol and acetaldehyde. I believe it's like one oxygen molecule difference between the two. Uh, acetaldehyde actually has I think it's one one extra oxygen. So. Or something along those lines. I'm not a chemist, but no, it's... I'm not either. But I think I, I took an online uh, beer chemistry class from University of Oklahoma or something like that. They had a free one, and I remember they got pretty in depth on that. And I think you're, I think you're right on that. Uh, aside from being a byproduct for fermentation, so what happens is, is um, oxidation can cause acetaldehyde, which a lot of people tend to concentrate on the fermentation side of it, where, you know, you pull your yeast off too soon, you're going to have it. But it's also a sign of oxidation of the of ethanol, not oxidation of your malt, but ethanol. And what happens is ethanol will pick up that extra oxygen molecule. What you end up with uh, is acetaldehyde and a molecule of water. So, um, yeah, it's, it's the one molecule difference from ethanol. So acetaldehyde, it can be a sign of post-fermentation aeration, either through transferring of your wort from your fermenter, from a primary to a secondary, or from your bottling bucket to your bottles or, or keg. The good news is this oxidation process can be reversed, if you catch it early enough, by sparking fermentation again or reactivating your yeast, and they will reabsorb or re-metabolize that acetaldehyde. Are you talking about, like, shaking your fermentation container or or putting new yeast in or, or what do you nope sugar sugar okay so what do we normally do uh, aside from force carving when you're kegging what what do we normally add when we bottle when you bottle yeah priming sugar exactly corn sugar and priming right. sugar and what are we doing when we do that we're re-sparking a small amount of fermentation because you're always going to have a little bit of yeast left over when you do that and that little bit of yeast is enough to get to that sugar and that's enough to make carbonation and that, yep, and that little bit of fermentation is enough to activate those yeast for those yeast to go, hey, there's some uh, seed aldehyde over here. Let's, uh, let's consume that and let's convert it back to, uh, ethanol. Okay. And so that is, that's why a lot of times you, d you don't end up with the seed aldehyde as a, as an oxidizer, but it can be a sign, especially if somebody is kegging. Typically, when you're giving feedback, it is normally, you know, you pulled your yeast off too soon. 
Just give it some time, and time will get rid of it. If it is oxidation, you are running a risk of, of uh, ending up with oxidized beer, and that acetaldehyde may not go away. But I think bacterial spoilage can also cause it, but bacterial spoilage can cause a lot anything. of things. Yeah, that's, that's a bad thing. We <laughs> it, don't... Just, it seems like every flaw you come across, it's like bacterial spoilage is a secondary uh, cause. Is it just way. me, or is that like one ugly, ugly phrase? Bacterial spoilage. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like something you should find in like a sewer in Jersey or something. Well, there are some beers that I think deserve to be in a Ugh. sewer in Jersey. Well, but... yeah. Not picking on Jersey, but. No, no, it's just a phrase. Yeah. Um, well, uh, there are ways to cure it. Yep. You can give your beer enough time on the fermentation vessel. I know in some cases it's just a case of the beer being pulled too soon, like you said earlier. So a chance to clean up after itself, that seems to be something that we should really let that let that do. But ideally, I think when you're transferring or packaging, you want to do your best to avoid aeration of the beer. You know, don't grab a bucket and just start walking around the garage or walking around the kitchen. You, you want to treat that gingerly. You want to... Yeah. Carry it, walk slowly, make sure you don't do any excessive movements. You don't want to pour from your bucket right into the bottle? No. It's it's something I've seen on forums. Uh, new, newer people saying, can I just dump my beer from a bucket into a bottle? So, well, I mean, for one, that would have to be a really big mouth bottle. Well, you've got, you've got um, funnels. Oh, I suppose, yeah. Just if you're starting out, that's not a good idea. Yeah, because any oxygen that you get can turn into acetaldehyde, and eventually you're going to get like a... Um, almost a cardboardy or a, a papery flavor type aroma. Mm-hmm. So you you don't want that. So, but what about like if you want if uh, somebody has a a pure oxygen aerator? Uh, they're aerating their their wort before beforehand. Aerating your wort beforehand with pure oxygen is is a good thing because your your yeast are going to need that. They're going to want that to help themselves maintain health and and start kick off a of fermentation. They're going to need that extra kicking the ass basically mm-hmm. um, pure oxygen is good but you don't want to overdo it though. you don't want to overdo it just i mean i've done it in the past i don't do it on a regular basis but i usually do no more than 20 seconds 30 seconds yeah um just enough that not we're not talking like five minutes 20 minutes like you do with a with a aeration no an aquarium pump no 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 um yeah. basically what happens is when you start injecting that oxygen into your into your work you're going to get and bubbles and, and head is basically going to form because you're you're oxygenating your your quote unquote carbonating that that beer you're getting that liveliness out of it so you're going to get a little bit of, of of head on that wort and I generally stop when it gets I don't know two inches three inches tall that's that's enough depending on what your head space is and your carboy or your your conical or whatever you're using so that's generally enough time but that usually translates to about twenty thirty seconds for me but. Yeah, that's that's a good thing. Oxygen in your in your primary is yeah. good. As as we talked about, you know, we'll we'll emphasize the three pillars of fermentation. You know, don't fear a- aeration, just don't overdo it. Mm-hmm. And if you if you remember from high school chemistry, it's <clears throat> oh hard. Boy. It's hard to dissolve oxygen into a warm solution. Normally, your beer is kind of warm, so it's going to be hard to get a dangerous amount of oxygen in there. But if you're if you're lagering and say you you have the ability to get your wort down to you know, the 40s or something, if that's what you're doing, and then you're aerating, that's when you might have a little bit of concern. But generally, you're going to be in, like, the 60s, and you're not going to get a lot of oxygen in there. Yeah. And pitching pitching rate and uh, fermentation temperature control. I mean, that's yep. that's one of the most important part of, parts of brewing. Yep. Um, and, with, and like you said, though, before, just um, acetaldehyde is acceptable in light American lagers. Yes, it is. Um, just because of that temperature change to what you got going on there, that you are going to have a little bit of it, so a little bit is acceptable. Yep, and that's so, the key word, a little. Yep. There's a lot of times it's a little too heavy, and uh, its low levels are acceptable. Yep. Uh, if you want to create a doctored beer sample, it is kind of hard to replicate acetaldehyde, but you can do it if you can find a good quality uh, green apple flavoring that doesn't taste like Jolly Ranchers. I say, what if you melt down a Jolly Rancher? No, nope, that's, that's going to be too candy and... Jolly Rancher doesn't really smell like fresh cut green apples. It smells like apple candy. Oh yeah, I suppose. You want that fresh cut green apple, which you, I was you, trying to help our listeners get a you know a little cheaper option for this. I Jolly know. Ranchers aren't that bad. No, they're not, but it won't give you the same. Yeah. Don't take my advice. No, no. You got to find something that smells just like green apples. Maybe you could put green apple, uh, 
cut up a uh, Granny Smith and juice it and put the put the juice in. Oh, there you go. That might work a little bit, but does it have to be a Granny Smith or could it be? I mean, I know this time of year there's a lot of uh, apple trees and things that a lot of, got a lot of green apples on them. Well, the the smell of like a Pink Lady or uh, or a Honey Crisp isn't going to be that same as gr- a green apple. Oh, I, I understand, but when you see an apple growing an, on a tree, an immature apple, yeah. it's green. Yeah. 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 Yep, that's sour, sour apple. Yep. Sour apple. Yeah. Okay. That's what you're looking for, that sour apple. Okay. Cool. Ar- aroma and flavor. All right. Um, I think that's the end of the sea aldehyde. I think we did a good job on that one. Uh, is there uh, anybody that has sponsored the show? I think uh, we're going to mention them right now. This segment brought to you by homebrewtalk.com. Visit homebrewtalk.com. It's your online resource for all things brewing related. They have a DIY section, a recipe section, a forum, sponsor area, they usually do giveaways. If you have a question, brewing related, someone's always usually willing to help out. Post a question, get an answer. It's a good environment. Check it out, homebrewtalk.com. All right. So, uh, got anything else to add, Jason? I don't. I think that's, I think that's a show. Closing notes, words of wisdom, advice for the, uh, homebrewer? Nothing? Not at this time. No. No. What about you? No. I think we covered everything pretty good. Uh, I've, I'd give you some more wisdom and advice, but I've just had a long weekend and, it's. We're hoping you stick with us. We hope we get through it. We'll see you on the other side of the tunnel and shoot us an email or something. Well, darn it, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of beer information out there. Yes, um, there is. So we appreciate you listening to us and, and getting our take on it. I, we understand we're not gods. We're not gospel. You don't have to listen to everything we say. But we're just two guys having fun. We're just two guys having fun. We're just doing this for you guys to help. Uh, maybe somebody's hoping to take an exam or somebody wants to make a better beer. There's plenty of choices. So. We appreciate you listening. Yep. So. All right. Other than that, I, I think good show. Pearls, stay hydrated. <laughs> <laughs>